Hi everyone, welcome to the October 13th edition of the Time Form US Pacecast. I'm David Aragon. I'll be joined in just a moment by my co-host, Craig Mulkowski. Well, this week on the podcast, we're going to take a look back at what I think is the final round of Breeders' Cup preps for now, just under four weeks out from the Breeders' Cup. And uh, we had some races at Belmont last week, as well as a few at Keeneland that we'll see if they produce some Breeders' Cup starters. Uh, but we had those five graded stakes races at Belmont Park on Saturday, including the Jockey Club Gold Cup and those two major two-year-old preps, the Champagne and the Frisette. We'll talk about all of that. But Craig, with all these Breeders' Cup preps in the books, I think we now have some sem of how the fields are going to come together. And I got to say, a lot of these Breeders' Cup divisions and races look pretty competitive. Yeah, it does. This is this is one of the more wide open years I can remember. I try not to dig too deep in, until we actually start getting the pre-entries and, and see who's going to go. Like, for example, I kind of like Code of Honor off his last race, but I've read where he's not going to point to a Breeders' Cup race now. So that was a little disappointing. So I don't want to get too ahead of myself. But yeah, looking at these races, uh, I think it's going to be a great betting day. And in, in the end, that that's my main focus. Yeah, and we'll talk about some of these races. Uh, I think the Saturday races, uh, the way they're coming up for the Breeders' Cup, are the ones that really look wide open. Some of the two-year-olds, I think, have asserted themselves at this point. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But let's begin at Belmont Park on Saturday with the feature race there, which was the Grade 1 Jockey Club Gold Cup, going the mile and a quarter. As we talked about in the forecast last week, the real story coming into this race was either Tacitus was just going to assert his superiority, get that grade one victory that he's been chasing for so long, or those up-and-coming three-year-olds were going to take a big step forward. And we got the answer. The three-year-old stepped up, and Tacitus actually took a step back. Yeah, I would say the same. I, I'm not particularly sure Tacitus wants to be on the lead, but that's far from an excuse. I mean, he set a really moderate pace. He was in the clear, and he just had no answers for Happy Saver and Mystic Guide. I thought those two both ran pretty well, but in the end, Happy Saver got a 123 speed figure from us, Mystic Guide a 122. So no doubt to me that this was a really weak grade one. Not not a big surprise on paper. Uh, you know, if you looked at the race beforehand on paper, I I imagine we'll see a couple of these in the Breeders' Cup, but I think they'd have to take another even bigger step forward to be serious contenders there. For this race itself, um, you know, I thought it was interesting. I thought Mystic Guide actually might have ran a little better. The two Happy Saver got a great trip in behind, was able to sneak through on the rail, while Mystic Guide was kind of pressing that, you know, chasing Tacitus out in the clear. And But they both ran well, and they both took a step forward, so I, I don't have any real problem with the result. Yeah, coming around the far turn, I mean, obviously I'm a fan of Mystic Guide. He's the horse that I picked and bet in the race, and he was a great price at 7-1. to one. And coming around the far turn, you could see that he was the one that was really going after Tacitus, and he kind of broke that horse. And Happy Saver, I was just kind of hoping he wouldn't get through, because you could see in behind horses, uh, Irad Ortiz still had horse left, and he was just trying to find a place for him to go. And I've got to give credit to the winner, because most inexperienced horses are not so willing to go through a small open like that down on the rail but he got through there and he's just such a strong finisher in all of his races it seems like he just kicks it into another gear uh no matter the distance and he did it again going a mile and a quarter here so uh he got the job done i think both of these three-year-olds are nice horses um where do you think that these two fit in the broader landscape of the three-year-olds how do they stack up against the horses that we saw in the triple crown uh, speed figure wise, there's still a few lengths below based on this race. Uh, horses like Authentic, the Philly, um, I can't uh, sk skydive, uh, skydiver. skydiver. <laughs> yeah, I, they're they're not quite up to that par yet, but you know they're also both pretty lightly raced and developing. They haven't been through those those grinding races. So if you ask me which were more likely to improve uh, in a month from now, I would say it would be these horses. Whereas the others are battle tested. They've been running pretty much solid speed figures for a while now. So a big jump would would be more of a surprise from them. Yeah, it's funny. The Breeders' Cup Classic, it's turning out to be a race that I think is just going to be overwhelmed by three-year-old contenders because, I mean, not that I'm saying that I think these two are the top contenders in that race, but there are just so many three-year-olds that could be dangerous in that race just because the older horses, I mean, aside from the improbables, Tom's Day Todd and um, Maximum Security, I mean, they just haven't really done that much. So uh, I think the three-year-olds are going to be really dangerous in that race. It's just a matter of which one you prefer. 
Yeah, I think uh, Improbable is still probably the horse to beat. Frankly, I'm tired of talking about Tom's data. He's allegedly been pointed to every race around the world all year, and I think he's ran like four times. So I don't know. He's still a very good horse. Uh, he's a seven-year-old. Maybe there's reasons for it. But when he shows up in the gate, I'll take more interest in him. No, I agree with that. He's got a ton of talent, but just doesn't show up on the racetrack that often. One Breeders' Cup race that got, I think, quite a bit of clarity uh, on Saturday was the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, uh, because the likely favorite for that race, uh, Jackie's Warrior, won this champagne in very impressive fashion. I mean, I was looking back at sort of the fields that we saw in past Breeders' Cup Juveniles and trying to remember the last time that we saw a two-year-old coming into the Juvenile just looking as dominant as Jackie's Warrior does. Now, we have to say that he was only beating Reinvestment Risk, who was also the horse that... uh, he vanquished in the in the um, in the hopeful prior to this, so he still has to get a class test against some other good horses. But boy, has Jackie's Warrior looked good. Yeah, he does look good for sure. Uh, I I mean, I have a little bit of reservations about that second turn. He, he's obviously going to be a heavy favorite. Uh, he's still only done the one turn races. Uh, I'll be interested to hear what you think about his breeding. But from a speed figure standpoint, he's been great. He ran a 116 last time in that hopeful. He got a 117 on this day. And I don't think reinvestment risk is any slouch. I mean, I think he's a really good horse who's maybe being lo- uh, made to look just a little bit pedestrian because of how good Jackie's Warrior is. Uh, I do think he is a solid top two year old, probably in, in the top three or four in the country. He just keeps running into Jackie's warrior. Yeah, I mean, anytime you've got a two-year-old consistently running speed figures upwards of 115, uh, you've got a pretty nice horse because uh, and sometimes you don't have three-year-olds running that fast in some of the stakes races we see next year. Uh, and Jackie's warrior, up to a mile, he's just way better than the other horses out there right now. The added distance and the two turns, maybe that's going to be a question. Um, his sire, McLean's Music, does get mostly one-turn horses, but we've seen him sire uh, Complexity, who can go a mile, uh, Cloud Computing, who won the Preakness. Now, that horse had more stamina breeding maybe on the dam side than Jackie's Warrior does. Um, Jackie's Warrior has sort of a lower-class female family. His dam actually was a really cool horse. I think she won 19 of 54 starts, but racing mostly in you know mid-level to late races, she wasn't really a, a graded stakes kind of horse. Uh, so we'll see if he can continue to go longer. He's definitely a, a big big, strong cult who seems like he might be able to handle another challenge. Uh, But I'm just looking forward to see how that Breeders' Cup Juvenile comes up and what he can do in that race, because the two turns, it's going to be exciting if he's a horse that can handle it. I think we saw another major contender for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies add her name to a list that already includes Simply Ravishing and Princess Noor in the present on Saturday, and that's Day Out of the Office, who frankly didn't run that much slower than Jackie's Warrior. And again, kind of like the Champagne, this was a race that was just really gapped out from first to last, which is usually indicative of a pretty fast race. Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, when I sat down to do the speed figures, I hadn't really paid much attention to the times during the day, which is a little odd for me. But, you know, if I don't have a reason to to watch them, I don't pay a whole lot of attention. And I was surprised how close she had run to Jackie's Warrior. I mean, that one got all the hype, but I just didn't hear the same hype for day out of the office. But she only ran four tenths slower, I think it was, and got a speed figure just four points lower at 113. As you said, uh, Vequist, the runner-up, or ran a good solid race got a 109 and second and then it was a huge gap back to the rest so I mean this horse is right there at the top of the division as well uh, with that kind of speed figure she's also going to have to deal with that second turn and you never really know how they're going to play out whereas the horses who have been running at San Anita and at Keeneland have already done that but she certainly got the talent and the speed to be competitive. Yeah, it's funny. I put out an informal Twitter poll right before we started this, uh, asking people who they'd prefer in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile, Juvenile Phillies out of Day Out of the Office simply ravishing at Princess Noor. And no surprise, Princess Noor is winning that poll and Day Out of the Office is running in last, uh, which is kind of the inverse of how the speed figures work out. I mean, Day Out of the Office, 113 is a really fast figure for a two-year-old filly. And frankly, Vequist shouldn't be out of the conversation in that Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies either, because she's now paired up a couple of fast figures in her win in the 
Spinaway and in this race. Um, and those two and Simply Ravishing are running numbers that are pretty impressive. I, I, we're, I'm not going to keep harping on it because we'll do that when we <laughs> when we actually preview the juvenile fillies. But I mean, these horses are running 10 to 12 points faster than Princess Noor, if not more than that. So uh, we'll see how that race comes up. But it could be a funny one where the speed figures don't really correlate to how the betting odds work out. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see this Breeders' Cup, how the West Coast horses do, because uh, I'm a huge fan of racing out West, but I don't think there's been and is any real doubt that there's been a drop-off in quality outside. I mean, we've seen a, a good horse pop up here and there, of course, from Bob Baffert as well, but I still just don't think they're going to be as battle-hardened because it's just not as strong a field as we usually see. No, I, I completely agree with that, especially, I think, among the two-year-olds you see it because uh, it just feels like some of those two-year-old divisions in California are exceptionally thin this year. Uh, and maybe, I mean, the speed figures don't lie. Uh, they suggest that Princess Noor and some of the Colts have been beating up on very weak competition, horses that probably normally wouldn't be running in grade one stakes races. So we'll see how that plays out when they actually run against the top horses on the East Coast and in the Midwest on Breeders' Cup Day. The other grade one that was contested on Saturday at Belmont was the Flower Bowl, prep for the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. Looked like a competitive race coming in. Chad Brown had three of them. They only managed to finish second, third, and fourth as Civil Union for Suge McGahey got the better of Chad Brown's horses once again. And uh, I think Joel Rosario deserves a lot of credit for the ride on this horse. He does for sure. Uh, this was a race we talked about on the forecast, and I, I actually like Civil Union quite a bit, but it wasn't in the way that it played out on the track. Uh, I thought she would use her speed, be up close, and, and kind of get a head start, and Joel Rosario just adapted to the pace scenario. I think on paper, it didn't look like there was much pace, but it, it didn't really turn out that way on the track. He took this horse back and, and just made a really good run. I uh, was able to get through and uh, just hold off at the end as so often when you get in a close battle at the wire Joel Rosario is just going to outstrength whatever other rider he's against uh, so if it comes down to those last 50 yards he's the guy I'm going to take 100 times out of 100 on my horse it's funny. It was a race that looked paceless on paper, but actually some of the fractions are color-coded in red, and it was a situation where two riders on horses that don't always have a ton of speed just seemed to have the same idea. Jose Lescano, somewhat surprisingly, sent Lovely Lucky kind of aggressively to the front, and obviously John Velasquez had the same idea with Cambier Park, and they ran a pretty fast opening quarter for this distance, or what we usually see going this distance, and I think that created a situation where you could give the kind of ride like Joe Rosario gave on Civil Union, just patiently waiting inside and it fell apart just enough that he was able to come through maybe you could make the argument that my sister Nat got the slightly worse trip because she had to go outside at the quarter pole and lost a little bit more ground and maybe that makes up for the head difference at the end uh, but both of these horses I thought ran well and it's kind of nitpicking to say one ran better than the other I still have doubts that they're among the better older fillies and mares out there on the turf and I'd kind of prefer the horses that are stretching out in the Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare turf rather than those that are turning back yeah, and I didn't mention the speed figure for the winner and the runner-up actually was only a 118, so pretty weak for a grade one for older fillies and mares, so I would tend to be on your side of that argument. I'd look elsewhere in the, the filly and mare turf. And the one other graded stakes that they ran on Saturday at Belmont was the grade two, Sands Point, for the three-year-olds going a mile. And this is a performance that I think turned a lot of heads. Uh, visually impressive was this winner, Tama here, who was making her first start in this country for Chad Brown. Uh, though the, the speed figure for the race doesn't quite correspond to, I think, the, the manner in which people were talking about this filly after the race. Yeah, I was a little surprised, honestly, watching the race. I mean, it, it looked visually impressive. I think I even tweeted something like a woman against the girls because that's what it looked like with the, the ease that she toyed with this field with. But it just didn't come back particularly fast. Now, granted, there wasn't a whole lot to go on on that surface that day. Um there was a two-year-old maiden race, I believe, and a three-year-old and up filly and mare maiden special weight or 
Uh, so th I didn't have a lot of info. So, I mean, it's possible maybe the figure could have been a little better. It's always hard to project the right amount of improvement from when you have races that are all for young, lightly raced horses. But that 108, I mean, how much bigger could it have been? It's not like a, she ran a 118 like the Flower Bowl. So maybe it was just she was beaten up on a, a group of horses that weren't that good, which is something we talked about going in. Uh, not the strongest field uh, figure-wise coming in, and now it's not the strongest field going out either. Yeah, I really don't think the figure should be any higher. If anything, it's it's a little too high. Um, just look at the other horses in this race, and her main competition didn't show up selflessly. For whatever reason, she seems like a horse that just randomly won't show up in certain races like she did in that wonder again earlier in the year. She just didn't have it in this race, and she was never really in the hunt. And Miss J. McKay, who was another horse who was fancied coming into this race— I don't know what was going on with her, but obviously John Velasquez couldn't ride her in the stretch. She was just sort of in traffic, and he couldn't get her out of trouble on the rail. She didn't run either, and you look who finished behind Tama here in this race. I mean, drop a hint who was third, who was beaten just two and three-quarter lengths. I mean, she's basically a claiming horse, uh, or basically a, a, an optional claiming horse out of town in the Mid-Atlantic region, who's just not at this level, and she finished third in this race. So I think it was just a situation where Tama here was beating a pretty subpar group. And if she shows up in a much tougher spot next time, I don't know where Chad Brown's going to run her. If he takes a shot at a race like the matriarch, I mean, I, they might think big with a Philly like this. She'd be one that I'd be a little skeptical of. I want to see her do it against real horses. Yeah, I think it will be interesting to see where uh, Chad Brown puts her because, I mean, I, I'm sure that he's a guy who looks at figures and he's going to know that she didn't beat much. So it'll be kind of interesting to see where she shows up. And I think that'll tell us uh, how much more maybe she had in the tank. But I tend to agree with you. I, I just don't think it was a very strong race and, and she had every right to beat this field and did, but nothing for me to get all overly excited about. Yeah, I know they also run that American Oaks at the end of the year at Santa Anita. Maybe that would be more of a reasonable target for her against straight three-year-olds, but we'll see. Um, she's just one that I'm, I'm still a little bit wary of moving forward. On Sunday at Belmont, they ran a couple of two-year-old races that could, I guess, be preps for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. We'll see if I've, any of these horses actually go there. Um, Wesley Ward had the favorites in both. He was able to win one of them. Uh, he had three horses actually entered in the Futurity, but they all came up short against 2nd of July, who has now won his two races for Phil Gleaves at just gigantic prices. He won his debut, I think, at 68-1, to 1, and here he paid $32. This one surprised me. He hadn't run much of a speed figure first time out in that upset with just the 76. And only the, this one, he only got a 91. Now, as a speed figure uh, guy, I will say the racing secretary didn't do me any favors running the uh, Futurity and the Matron on different courses for some reason, even though they ran multiple races on one of the courses. So uh, you couldn't really compare the times to each other. So, uh, you know, these figures are, I would say, a little bit iffy. They're not ones I, I would just be supremely confident in but uh the 91 is nothing i'm gonna get excited about after five who came in as the favorite just regressed a lot off that opening figure everybody else kind of ran the same race and it, it looked like second of july was the only horse making up ground uh, at the end i, I don't want to get too uh too down on him. I mean, when a horse wins two races like that at huge prices, it does make you take notice. But I, I would be very surprised if he's a serious contender in the juvenile turf sprint. Yeah, I was a little disappointed in this race in general. I mean, I guess you could make the case that after five was best because both of these horses were towards the back of the pack in the early going, and the field really bunched up. After a fir after a fast opening quarter, they just slowed it down coming around the far turn to the quarter pole, and the entire field bunched up at the top of the stretch. After five, Irad Ortiz really had no choice but to just stay down on the rail and wait for room, and the room never really materialized, and he got shuffled back to last. He had to swing out to the far outside and try to pass them all in the final quarter, which is just kind of hard to do. Um, so maybe he was the best horse, but you could also say they didn't come home that fast. Maybe he should have gotten there anyway, even with that poor trip. So um, I don't know. This race was okay, but I feel like uh, after five, who's in the Wesley Ward barn, he's probably the fourth or fifth best two-year-old that will be pointing towards the Breeders' Cup tur Juvenile Turf Sprint anyway. So we'll see if any of these horses actually go there, but I think there are better horses out there. 
Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. The one golden pal, I think it is. He's still talking about it as the best horse he's ever trained. Uh, and don't get me wrong, he'll probably run more than a few in there, probably three or four at least, given the, the lineup that he has. But as you said, I don't think after five, it's one of his, uh, one he considers one of his top horses. And he might consider running the matron winner, Royal Approval, who did run a faster race just based on the surface of things than um, the horses in the futurity, the Colts, I should say, in the futurity. Uh, I have some questions about the quality of the field in this matron. And as you were pointing out, it's hard to be sure of which of these races was actually faster as they were run on different turf courses. This number does seem a little high for the horses that finished behind her, but obviously Royal Approval is a talented enough failure. I just don't know how she really stacks up against the horses that we'll see in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. Yeah, she got a 98 for the try. Uh, and as you mentioned, this is the one where they only ran one six furlong race on the uh, inner turf course, the one that she ran on. So it was the toughest figure to make. I kind of had to look at the route races and try to figure out the sprint because you just don't want to base sp speed figures on projections from, from two-year-olds only because that's going to get you in trouble. Your figures are going to shrink because it's just really hard to guess how much better they got. So like I said, I I'm not going to put a whole lot of stock in this speed figure and it's not that great anyway if anything i would suspect it's a, a little on the high side as you do but um just yeah these races sunday left me wanting a little bit i uh, didn't didn't see a whole lot that got me excited let's briefly get away from the breeders cup preps and just talk about a couple of promising two-year-olds that we saw at belmont this past week one of them was on saturday and we actually talked about this race on the time formulas forecast when we were handicapping the pick five sequence this was the race that kicked off the pick five on saturday at belmont a two-year-old maiden race going a mile on the 16th on the turf and we had said that there looked like some promising two, uh, first time starters in this field the one that was really touted turned out to be the christoph clement runner big everest who was second in here but the winner of this this race hard love ran a pretty high speed figure for a two-year-old on the turf and this Jonathan Thomas trainee looks like one that has a real future yeah, and I'll admit this is another one that was a little tough to make the speed figure, but I am pretty confident, more confident than I am in those uh, six furlong turf sprints from Sunday. Uh, we had a mile race with a little bit longer run up and, and the variance lined up really good with this one. So this one wound up with a 109, which you said it, it's a big figure. It's it's not off the charts or anything like that, but it it's one that if this horse showed up in a race like the Breeders' Cup, I have no idea if he could get in or not, but he would certainly look uh, just as strong as as any others we've seen this year. Yeah, and especially given the gaps between the horses from, you know, the, the winner to the horses in the middle of the pack or those that finished at the back suggests that this was a fast race because sometimes these two-year-old races, you see them all hit the wire together. I mean, there was, I think, 25 or 45 lengths from first to last in this race. And uh, these top two, Big Everest and Hard Love, I should say Hard Love and Big Everest, Hard Love won the race, um, really drew away from the third place finisher, Hardison, who already had solid experience at Saratoga. Um, and I think the top three horses in this race all are going to have futures uh and hard love is a horse uh he's by kitten's joy and coming around the far turn of this race he was already under a ride by betty franco and big everest was ranging up like he was going to run right by him and hard love just kept responding to that encouragement and kicked away again at the end kind of like a horse that is going to appreciate more distance and as a son of kitten's joy that would hardly be surprising so uh, i'd look forward to both of these horses uh, showing up somewhere next time because they both seem to have talent yeah, I was going to mention Big Everest. Uh, I was impressed with Hard Love, uh, the way Big Everest actually looked like he was going to go right by to me, and he just dug in and pulled away. Big Everest went ran a 106, which is a, a very strong figure. We'd be saying it was a good figure if this was a stakes race, so strong effort from these two, and definitely one I think is going to be a key race. And I'll also say the third place finisher, Hardison, um, I'd look for him maybe to try the dirt next time out. And I wonder if Bill Mott will do that when they get to Aqueduct uh, and they have some of those mile and an eighth races that are available because he seems like a real grinder that'll want to run all day. And he, he really does have a dirt pedigree. He's out of that good, good dolphin mare octave. Uh, so uh, I, I want to see him try the dirt in the future.
Speaking of uh, Godolphin, we saw uh, Godolphin and Shadwell go head-to-head in a Friday two-year-old maiden race at Belmont, going seven furlongs for the two-year-old Phillies. And uh, this pair of first-time starters, Malathot and Caramel Swirl, really threw it down to the wire and drew well clear of the rest of the field. Craig, I know this is a race that probably you wouldn't have sent in because it didn't come back that fast, but these just seem like a couple of horses that, that might have promise down the line. Yeah, I figured you wanted to talk about it, so I didn't question it. It only got a 92 uh, time form U.S. speed figure, 91 for the runner-up Caramel Swirl. Uh, But as you said, they did look good. Uh, They were running good at the end. The pace, it it started out a little quick, got slowed down, and and then they were really flying home. So this is what I want to see from juveniles when I'm looking for horses to stretch out. I want to see that finishing kick. Uh, I don't like the horses that run short and get uh, big early red fractions and get big pace boosts. I mean, they're usually the kind that are, are sprinters, but that's not what I see in this field. And I'm happy to turn it over to you and see what you think here. Yeah, there was hype around both of these Phillies coming into this race. Caramel Swirl had actually been entered once at Saratoga. I think she scratched on the last weekend there. And Mala thought uh, she's a million-dollar first full to race out of Dreaming of Julia, who was uh, a very talented horse uh, racing as a three-year-old filly. Uh, she ran a gigantic speed figure at Gulfstream in the spring of that season uh, about 10 years ago for Todd Pletcher. Uh, but this is her first full to make it to the racetrack, and Malathot just seems like one that's really going to appreciate the distances getting longer in the future. As you said, uh, they kind of slowed this race down in the midsection, but I love the way that these two sprinted home at the end of the race. And Caramel Swirl arguably ran the better race because she got left at the start. She broke awkwardly, was at the back of the pack, had to make a mid-race move up into contention. Looked like she was going to go right by, but I think that poor start took its toll at the end of this race. Uh, she's out of a half-sister to Frosted, so another strong Godolphin pedigree agree for her and uh, just seems like two Phillies that uh, might have a future over the winter. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Frosted. It's getting to be that time of year where we're starting to see who the the better freshman sires are and it looks like he's going to be one of them so far. Yeah, a lot of these horses that have those sires pedigrees that we're starting to see their foals run this year uh, are really establishing themselves. I mean, we saw Nyquist. He's had a couple of good ones so far. Not this time. So it'll be it'll be fun to see how uh, they develop as three year olds. Let's move on to Keeneland, where I don't know if we saw necessarily Breeders' Cup preps among the older horses, but we saw some good graded stakes action on Saturday, uh, topped by the Queen Elizabeth II Challenge Cup, which was won by a horse that I know we're both fans of, Harvey's Little Goyle. Um, She's just a cool horse that can run on either surface. It's probably established at this point, though, that she's best on the turf, and she got her grade one victory here. Yeah, I thought this was a really nice effort from her. Uh, the pace was just moderate. We don't have it coated red or blue, but she she was able to sit right there on the lead, showing some speed that we don't always see on dirt from her. Uh, that's why I think she's she's a little bit better on turf. But she was able to fight off the challenge of Micheline, who always seems to show up and run a good race and make that late kick. Uh, no real excuses for any of the others. I thought Magic Attitude just ran okay. Uh, you were spot on about her on the forecast, thinking that she she just kind of picked on horses that weren't very good last time. I mean, she ran okay. She got a 113, actually improved the point. But Harvey's Little Goyle ran a, uh, a big speed figure for a three-year-old filly. That 117, as we already talked about, the Flower Bowl with Old her horses uh, was just a point below that so solid effort from her and, and I hope we keep seeing her on the grass yeah I mean I couldn't quite believe that she went off at seven to two and Micheline was 11 to one in this race I mean not just the disparity between those two prices but that they were both such bettable prices in this spot because frankly they had both run really well at Kentucky Downs last time with Micheline actually getting the better of Harvey's low Goyle and uh, I mean I guess I kind of understand the support for Magic Attitude given how visually impressive she was I didn't get why Sweet Melania took so much money in this race. And I mean, we said it on the forecast ahead of time that we were both against her. She got bet down to five to two and just didn't show up. And credit to Martin Garcia for that ride on Harvey Slow Goyle because he hustled her out of the gate, got her into that stalking position. And I think getting the first jump on Magic Attitude and Micheline really made the difference in this race. Uh, Micheline did get spun a little wide off the far turn, but that's just always going to be a problem with a horse like her that has that running style that wants to come around horse. So she'll get unlucky sometimes. But she ran really well, too. And um, I do think these are probably the best three-year-old Philly turf horses out there. 
Yeah, I will mention, uh, I do think there is something the horses that come from those uh, Kentucky down races, getting a little more fitness. They just always seem to run well when they leave Kentucky downs and go to other tracks. It's obviously a very uh, tough track to run over. It's got those undulations and hills, and I think it's an uphill finish. Uh little odd odd track, more European style, but it does seem to give horses an advantage when they come out of there. And I don't know if we said it, Harvest Local Oil got a 117 time for the best speed figure. I believe that's the highest that we've seen in this division for among the three-year-olds so far on the turf because we keep talking about how uh, these horses keep underperforming a lot of these three-year-old Philly turf races. So I, I think this figure kind of stands out. Yeah, I, I do believe it is the best we've seen from a three-year-old Philly for sure. Now, the 117 that was earned by Mr. Freeze in the Fayette, the race right before the Queen Elizabeth, that does not stack up so well against the other uh, older males are running on dirt right now. Uh, this horse, I mean, he kind of went off form over the summer. I guess you could argue that he's getting back into better form based on this victory, even though he didn't run that fast. I don't know. Watching this race, I just wasn't really that impressed with any of these horses. No, this was kind of an ugly race. Uh, it's a grade two, I believe it is these days, and a 117 figure is nothing uh, to write home about. Aurelius Maximus, a horse we've uh, talked about before, uh, we've said maybe he's a stakes horse. He looked pretty good, but he actually only went up off at four to one. It kind of showed how weak this field is. And in fact, Mr. Freeze was eight to five off of two basically putrid efforts. I mean, that last time where he just absolutely walked on a, a lead and, and I don't really use the term walked. Uh, I mean, I used the term walked literally almost. That's how slow they went and he gave it up anyway, but he did seem to come back. He showed a little new dimension, able to come from a little further off. He was wide all the way around. So, I mean, maybe you could give him a, a little bit of an excuse for that, that he was wide the whole way and, and upgrade that figure a little bit. But that said, it's still a long way from, from a 117 to what he would need to, to run in the Breeders' Cup if he showed up in the dirt mile or the classic they had mentioned both after the race I, I guess the dirt mile would be the way to go if I was going to try one of these races but he still would have his work cut out yeah I think Dale Robbins is talking about trying this horse in the dirt mile and I'm just not quite seeing it. What bothers me most about Mr. Freeze is that he just doesn't seem to have the early speed that he once possessed. I mean, make no mistake about it. Javier Castellano was really sending him out of the gate, and Mr. Freeze just couldn't get there. He got outrun to the lead by three other horses, even though they were not going very fast up front. And the fact that he was able to get so forward on the backstretch, I think, was just a function of the fact that the pace was so slow. And he kind of got the jump on Aurelius Maximus, who, Ricardo Santana, I, I think he... Um, kind of got tricked into taking this horse back at a time when he should have been going forward on the back stretch, and maybe that made the difference. Mr. Freeze did dig into win late. I just I just questioned the quality of what was behind him, and he's not really a horse I want moving forward off this performance. No, and, and it's just, I mentioned Aurelius Maximus. Uh, I think he was probably the best in here. He didn't get a great trip, but being the best in here, uh, I'm not sure where that, that leaves you. Now, one horse that I think we are excited to see moving forward is the horse that won earlier in the day, Keeneland, on Saturday. Uh, that would be the three-year-old Colt Nashville, who was making his second career start in an allowance race going six furlongs. Uh, I mean, Craig, I'll let you talk about the speed figure for this race. And I mean, how good is this horse? Yeah, I mean, who knows? Second career start, he ran a 130. We we don't see that very often. I remember Justify, I think, ran a 130 in his debut. Uh Maybe Beholder ran a huge figure second or third time out. I can't remember which one. I think it was second time out. She ran like a 130. And that's pretty lofty company. We don't often see it. Now, granted, this horse looks like pretty much a pure sprinter to me. Um, but he is fast. There's no doubt about it. I don't know where Steve Asmussen plants his uh, sprinter tree, but he's obviously got it in full bloom because every time uh, we turn around, he's sending out another one that's just running holes in the wind and... Just really exciting horse. I, I'm not sure where he's going to go from here. Uh, if he's even uh, would get into a race like the Breeders' Cup Sprint if they tried. But with a speed figure like this, I would certainly try if I were his connections. Uh, not, not sure where they were hiding him all this time. Looks like he took a little time to get to the races in the first place. But once he's made it, man, he is one fast horse. 
Yeah, I remember before his debut, um, he was not facing a strong field at Saratoga, but I always watch the workouts that are available on XBTV for the first time starters. And I remember watching this horse's gate drill before his debut and it just looked so fast. I got out by my stopwatch and tried to time his opening quarter from the gate. And he ran something crazy like 21 and one out of the gate from at Saratoga in the morning. You just, you just don't see horses show that kind of speed without being asked in their morning workouts. And boy, this horse is something special. Uh, and there was talk that maybe he was a sloppy track freak after his debut. He's probably better on a fast track based on this performance. And I was reading that the owners at least have said that they're very much looking at the Breeders' Cup sprint. And that division seems totally wide open and also seems like it doesn't have that much real early speed in it. So I think if he gets into that race, which is a real question mark, he's got no graded stakes earnings or points towards that race. Uh, but uh, it would he'd be a major contender if he did get in. Yeah, my guess is he would get in because, I mean, we haven't seen a full field in the sprint for quite a while. Maybe it'd be a little different this year, but I suspect that if he enters, he'll wind up in the gate. Now, going back to Friday at Keeneland, we saw uh, the grade three Franklin County going five and a half on the turf for the Phillies and Mares and got Stormy, who uh, was the runner up in last year's Breeders' Cup mile. She's now turned back and She's actually a pretty good sprinter. I don't know if she can be competitive in a race like the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint, uh, but now twice in a row, she's handled sprint distances and she's figured out how to finish off her races going this shorter trip. Yeah, I'm not sure what to make of her. Uh, so as you said, she's run two sprints in a row. That one at uh, Kentucky Downs was, I think, six and a half furlongs and really seven because of the really long run up. And this one was only five and a half. I do note that her, her speed figure regressed a little bit. She was a little further back early, which is probably a function of that shorter distance having faster paces. So yeah, as far as the Breeders' Cup, I imagine maybe they're going to try the Breeders' Cup turf sprint, but I wouldn't be a fan of hers. I think she's probably still better at a mile, but not good enough to win a race like the Breeders' Cup mile this year. Uh, she was in a lot better form last year, but no knocks on her. She's a cool horse. She's versatile. Uh, she has... The fact she could come from so far back and win a race like this after she's won races wire to wire shows to her versatility. But I still don't think she's quite the same sure she was last year. I just think she's found been placed in some really good spots and, and found fields that she could beat. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know where she stands among the male horses in this division, but I will say... I didn't watch this race live and I kind of saw the speed figure before I actually watched it. We were doing the prep for this show and I was kind of expecting not to be impressed based on that 114 time form US speed figure. But watching the race, she ran pretty well. I thought Tyler Gaffleon gave her a lot to do because uh, the pace, I mean, they weren't flying up front. It was an, an honest pace and she was still really far back and he wasn't even asking her at the back of the pack. It's like he just knew she was going to get it done. And I think he almost overestimated how quickly they were going up front because those horses on the lead weren't coming back and she just ran and and, and came and got them. Nobody else made, came, made a, a run from the back of the pack like that. So um, this was an inferior field, but I, I think I'd upgrade her performance a little bit based on that or off that speed figure. Um, again, I'm not saying that she's my pick for the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint or anything like that, but I think that she does have a right to run in that race. Oh, for sure. And, and as you said, she was absolutely flying at the end. And uh, yeah, it was a little dicey for the jockey there because it, it was pretty darn tight on the wire. Uh, it, it was hard to tell even watching live for sure that she won. I thought maybe she got the nod, but I, it wasn't one I would have wanted to place a bet on. So good effort from her. It'll, it'll be interesting to see where she goes. And, and maybe they were trying something just to come from off the pace, hoping a race Coming up, you know, she could show that same thing where we're definitely going to get some more pace in a race like the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. Let's wrap up this week's Breeders' Cup preps by going all the way back to Wednesday at Keeneland when they ran the grade two Jessamine for the two-year-old Phillies on the turf. And uh, I think we saw some major players that are going to be running in the Breeders' Cup race in this division as Aunt Pearl now is two for two in her career for Brad Cox. She was very impressive winning her debut at Churchill Downs and this performance was basically a carbon copy of that one. Yeah, it was a very good effort. Uh, as the figure guy, I want to comment, we don't have any pace figures in here. It's because uh, Keeneland has added some new gate positions for their various turf races. And this is one they had never run before. It had a really long run up. There were a lot of questions after the race if the, the 
fractions and the times could be right. I think the opening quarter was like 22.30 something or other. And it turns out it was right. It's just that it's a lot longer run up that they've ever used before. So I wouldn't put a lot of stock in her shattering the stakes record. It, it was mostly a function of the run up. She still only, she got a 101 time form US speed figure, which is solid. Uh, she had run a 99 winning first time out, but it's one that's just going to put her in the mix in a race like the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf, not make her any kind of standout or anything. Yeah, I think people might see that opening quarter and assume this was a fast pace. And if you, you, I know you didn't make pace figures for these races, but if you watch a few of the races at Keeneland that use similar run-ups throughout this week, um, a lot of, there were a lot of very fast opening quarters. So I wouldn't go so far as to say this was a pace that was very taxing for Aunt Pearl. Um, I'd look more at the fractions, the interior fractions that she set after that opening quarter when she did slow down the pace quite a bit and then sprint for home. And um, this was not a race where we saw a whole lot of movement from the back of the pack in general. I actually think a horse like the third place finisher in Gracia ran pretty well in here because they were slowing it down after that fast opening eighth of a mile. And she was towards the back of the pack. She had to go very very wide off the far turn to make her late run. I'm not saying she's as good as Aunt Pearl or necessarily that she's a horse to bet back in the Breeders' Cup, um, but I, I would not say that Aunt Pearl uh, was um, necessarily hurt by her trip in this race or hurt by a taxing pace because I'm not sure it was it was as taxing as what the fractions might appear. Yeah, and what I will do is, is after Keeneland finishes up their meet or even if they add them remember when they finish if it's before the Breeders' Cup but because of the significance of this race I will go back and make a baseline for these races with the long run-up and add pace figures to it because I don't want to be handicapping a Breeders' Cup race and, and not have a sense of the flow from a numerical standpoint so you will see those added in at some point. And speaking of fast opening quarters on the turf at Keeneland, we saw the exact same situation in a race on Thursday uh, when Mr. Duma won an allowance race, uh, the ninth race on the card on Thursday at Keeneland. Uh, this horse won impressively. He came from off the pace to do it, uh, getting some class relief here. But again, with the pace, it's the same situation where they appeared to go very fast early, moderated in the middle of the race. Um, this one, though, it did feature a faster pace than the Jess Spine that allowed Mr. Duma to come from off the pace here. Yeah, this was a really solid allowance rate. He wound up with a 123 speed figure, and in this case, it is a true speed figure because it's just based on final time. But he's run that before when he, he gets the right circumstances. Uh, he's a, a solid enough horse, fringe stakes player, in my opinion. And, you know, maybe he'll take that step forward, but I, I'm not going to get too excited about a horse like him because he, he's proven the struggle when he rises up in class. Yeah, he's been a little bit inconsistent. He ran that big race up at Saratoga behind his stablemate, Some Like It Hot Brown, I think in the Bernard Baruch, I want to say. But he hasn't always run to that level in graded stakes. So even this is though this is a graded stakes level speed figure, as you said, you want to see him do it against that tougher company again. The race on Thursday at Keeneland that actually really caught my eye was the fourth race on the card, three-year-old allowance race going a mile and a 16th on the dirt. And... Big Dreaming, uh, a horse who had run three times on the turf already, uh, got the job done here in his first start on the dirt. And based on this performance, he's actually a better dirt horse because this is an impressive speed figure for a three-year-old that's lightly raced. Yeah, this is. Uh, he jumped up to a 119. I, I think his best prior on the turf had been like a 109 or 110, something like that. Uh, so he's a horse who definitely looked like he prefers dirt. And surprisingly to me, he was able to show uh, solid speed. It, it was a really strong, not, I mean, it was a strong pace. It wasn't crazy fast. We have one of the fractions coated in red, but it certainly wasn't easy. And as a horse who's been running on turf, it, it had to be a little bit of a, a different pace scenario. And he was right up there sitting second off the lead and still was able to finish it off strong. Uh, he beat the solid horse in Sonneman, a horse we, we've talked about about often he's been running for a while decent enough three-year-old but I just like the way he did it and the way he was able to lay close to that pace yeah and it shouldn't be a major surprise that he's a dual surface horse because he's out of the damn dreaming of Anna who was a multi-millionaire multiple graded stakes winner uh we remember her mostly as a turf horse later in her career but let's not forget she won the breeders cup juvenile fillies as a two-year-old on the dirt uh so she could certainly handle both surfaces and it just seems like this horse has that same affinity for dirt and turf so i'll be interested to see what they do with him but for now seems like one to keep on the dirt 
Yeah, he's another one that came out of Kentucky Downs, got that good foundation under him. Uh, uh, one of these days I'm going to have to sit down and run some stats off of that, but it just seems like we get a disproportionate number of winners coming out of that track. Yeah, that's an interesting point you make. We'll have to pay more attention to that. Let's finish things up uh, going to the third venue we'll visit uh, on this recap podcast, that being Monmouth Park, where their one graded stakes from this last weekend was the grade three Monmouth stakes going a mile and an eighth on the turf. And we actually saw a repeat winner as Almanar, who was the winner of the 2019 Monmouth stakes, which took play on May 25th. He now won the Monmouth stakes in 2020 on October 10th. So uh, he was off for over uh, 16 months coming into this race. Got the job done again, though, and this horse, we don't see him that often, but when we do see him, he's pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, I'm wondering, is he the first horse ever to have consecutive starts in the same stakes race and win them both? Uh, It's certainly a scenario we're not going to see play out very often, but man, when he shows up, he he can run. Uh, His last two have been good. When he won the race last year, he got a 128 speed figure from us, and he got a 124 this year. Uh, I personally don't think the race was quite as strong this year, but it was still a good effort from him, and uh, it'd be interesting to see if Chad Brown can keep this horse together to, to mount any kind of campaign yeah it's he's just a funny horse to look back on because it didn't feel like he was gone for that long i remember hearing about him trading recently and i just didn't realize he was coming off of such a long layoff i mean you go just five starts back in his career and he was second in the 2018 arlington million behind robert bruce it feels like just a horse from another era uh but uh yeah he's still good as an eight-year-old and i don't know how much he's really got left in or when we'll see him again but this was a solid performance yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, he's one you just got to watch the entries and see where he turns up. But when he does, he's going to be dangerous. Well, that's all the racing to recap this week. Uh, and as I said at the top of the show, the Breeders' Cup preps are pretty much all in the books at this point. Uh, so we'll see what's coming up this weekend to handicap. I know there are still some graded stakes that will be taking place around the country when we do the Time Formulas forecast. But for next week's pace cast, uh, maybe we'll start to do some Breeders' Cup pre- uh, Breeders' Cup previews. Uh, we should have a pretty good uh, idea by that point in time how these races are coming up. And there's so much ground to cover with the Breeders' Cup races. We can try to give the each race the time that it's really due and uh it won't be that long before the pre-entries come out uh as uh, as i said we're just uh over three weeks away from the breeders cup taking place on that friday and saturday so an exciting time in horse racing a lot to look forward to and we'll try to cover some of it on these podcasts in the coming weeks remember you can always listen to us on drf.com spotify itunes youtube and soundcloud wherever you get your podcast just make sure to subscribe to the daily racing form channel Thanks for listening this week, and we'll be back with the Time Form US forecast on Friday.